Okay, so we continue. In the first part of the lecture, I explained how to convert the Fisher projection to the ring of the sugar. So in this case, you have a D glucose because the OH is on the right. Okay, but that OH can be used to attack this carbon and this carbon will open up. And we explained that um, you need to rotate, okay, rotate the molecule. You always want to number from here, from top to bottom, but rotate the molecule 90 degrees. So in which case you're rotating it this way. Okay, now it's horizontal. So now we use this OH, which helped us to classify it as D. Okay, use that to attack the aldehyde. But before you do that, you want to make sure that this chain, this part of the chain, is kind of curved. And that's what you're seeing here. Now, so if you curve it, so if you allow this carbon uh, C1, if you allow C1 and C6 to be close by, this is what you'll see. But this is not the OH we want to attack the blue carbonyl. We want this OH. So we do the rotation, okay, where now the OH is very close to the blue carbonyl. Now this OH will be used to attack, and that opens up. As it opens up, it picks up a hydrogen, okay? And the hydrogen picks up actually could be this hydrogen right here, okay? Or another hydrogen, a proton in the solvent. So you, you get to open the carbonyl to get OH, and that's the OH on C1. And then this oxygen that used to be the OH will lose the hydrogen. The hydrogen that used to be here is gone. And actually, that hydrogen could be the same hydrogen that will be picked up on the other side of the oxygen. So now you've crossed the link because as the oxygen attacks this carbon, you're making this bond. So the carbonyl opens up, picking up a hydrogen, and this oxygen will lose the hydrogen that it had initially. So you make a ring, and that's a six-membered ring, we call it a pyranose. Similar mechanism can be followed to make a five-membered ring. You'll always use this OH on the second last carbon at the bottom of the Fischer's projection. Okay, and we said there are two types of represent representation of the ring. Um, either you're going to represent it as flat ring, which is the Howard projection. Or Howard diagram. This just helps you to picture and see who is down and who is up the ring. So this help us to classify the um, um, alpha and beta anomers of the ring. Those are isomers of the ring. So like this one, the OH that came from the carbonyl. See, uh, let me show you see this OH right here this used to be a carbonyl that OH could end up up or down so if the OH is up and this CH2OH is up we call that beta so this will be the beta anoma if this OH and the CH2O2 are down that will be the alpha so the same same Howard projection can be drawn like this where you want the big groups equatorial, we defined that when big groups are equatorial, the ring is more stable to avoid one, three diaction interactions. We talked about that in an earlier chapter. So this is the typical chair. That's the chair diagram. Okay. That's the chair diagram. This is the Howard. So like I said again, you get to get anomers on the carbon of the carbonyl, which is this carbon. It used to be a carbonyl, but the OH attacked it to open up to make an OH on it. So like the, the OH can end up down or it can end up up the ring. 
So when it's down, we call that alpha. Of course, it's still D because it came from a D glucose. Okay. On the Fisher projections, we knew we know it's a D because that OH was on the right. But now we are saying it's alpha because the OH is down, the CH2OH is up, looking across that middle oxygen. Okay. So here, looking across this middle oxygen, the OH and CHO2 are on the same side. Okay, these two guys are on the same side, so we call it beta. Okay, so we call these two structures, we call these two structures anomas because the only difference in configuration is on the anomeric carbon, the carbon that used to be a carbonyl. The stereochemistry there is different. So if one is R, the other one is S. If one is S, the other one is R. The rest of the stereocenters. All these centers are kept, but that one is switched. So technically, one would call these diastereomers. These two rings are diastereomers, but specifically in sugars, we call them anomers. Okay, so you have the anomeric carbon that would have the OH down or the OH up. So now, depending on the orientation, where OH is opposite to CH2OH, that's alpha. Where OH is same side as CH2OH, that's beta okay so there's what we call neutral rotation so now we can continue that was just a review of what we talked about in the last class i think it was a tough concept so i told myself i'll have to repeat myself so um mutual rotation the two conformation alpha and beta of the hemiacetal form can be interconverted okay so which means this alpha can be converted to the beta. So what you're looking at here is mutual rotation. Okay, so one would first open up the ring moving forward, which is unlikely, and then attack again to get the, and then I, I mean, and then attack the carbonyl, and this time you put the OH up. You will have converted the alpha to the beta. That's what we call mutual rotation. It's just like you're mutating it. You're mutating the ring to something else. Okay, so neutral rotation is the, just the interconversion of alpha to beta. Okay. And you might use a base or an acid to do that. The equilibrium concentration need not to be equal for alpha and beta forms. It's not selective. Either you're going to favor the alpha or the beta. No, who knows? Okay, so... Carbohydrates. The formation of cyclic hemiacetal can create either five or six membered ring, which I've already said. So you use Fisher projections okay, to either make a six membered ring, we call that a pyranose, or a five membered ring. You see, these are five membered ring counting the oxygen in the four carbons, you get furanose. Okay, which one is more stable? Of course, the six member ring because it's less sterex. So, if you want to get a um, five member ring, then you'll have to use this OH. You use that to attack that carbon. This opens up, making an OH, which is simply this OH. And that OH could either up or down. So, alpha or beta. Now, if you want to get a six member ring, you'll use the below one. But let's go back up down up here. So, you see, if I count the elements making the ring from where I started my arrow to attack the carbonyl, that oxygen would be one. So, probably this is two, three, four, five. So, that's how you make the five member ring. Anything else, meaning this tail, will be that substituent. Okay, I already explained how to make a six member ring. You would use this to attack the carbonyl. The OH opens up, the oxygen opens up, picking up a hydrogen, and that's how it makes an OH. Okay, so again, if you want to count, let me use a different color. If you want to count, this will be element one of the ring. So if you want to count the elements in the six member ring, you start here one, two, three, four five six okay so you make a six member ring counting the oxygen this will be the one and this will be the six carbon 
they are numeric carbon and numeric carbon because the OH could be up or down, up or beta. So one six, this will be two, three, four, and five. Just counting what makes the ring. But if you are to give it the UPAC numbering, will number from the top carbon to the bottom carbon. So now again, this one now is anything else that becomes a substituent. So I just want you to be aware that you can have a five-member drink or a six-member drink depending on which OH attacked the carbonyl, the aldose carbonyl. So you end up with a hemiacetal anyway because you have, you have the oxygen to the rest of the ring R group and then you have the anomeric carbon with a hydrogen and an OH. So remember what we say, whenever the carbon is bonded to an OH and an OR, that's called hemiacetal. If it was OR, OR, that would have been an acetal. So these rings are hemiacetals. Okay. So like six-membered rings, carbohydrates are more stable in the chair conformation. Okay. They don't like staying in the fissure. They don't like staying in the fissure. Usually they cyclize to the chair because the chair now becomes rigid and more stable. And like we said, you have an anomeric carbon once you cyclize the fissure using the OH to attack the carbonyl of the aldehyde. Using the OH to attack the carbonyl of the aldehyde, you cyclize it, okay? And once you cyclize, you get a six-membered ring or five-membered ring. So in this case, you are shown six-membered ring. Okay, so again, look for the substituent next to the oxygen and the OH sitting on a carbon next to the oxygen. Right now, these two guys, these two guys are opposite. And because they are opposite on the chair, opposite side of the chair, one is up. This is up equatorial, meaning it's on the same plane as the ring. This is down and axial as we learned about chairs in a very early chapter. So because they are opposite, we say that this structure here is an alpha. In this case, the substituent CH2OH and OH sitting on the anomeric carbon are on the same side. See, look, both of them are up up equatorial for both of them the uh, the key point is for you to see that's up that's up they are same side here this is up equatorial this is down axial up down they're opposite so because they are up up they are same they're on the same side of the ring again i will emphasize that when they're on the same side of the ring we call that beta uh, sugar. So in this case, this is beta D glucopyranose because a six member drink. This is alpha D glucopyranose because it's a six member drink made from D glucose, but the OH is alpha. So you see how that's how you name these things. This is beta because the CH2OH and OH on the anomeric carbon are both of them are up on the same side. It could be up, up, down, down, doesn't matter. They're on the same side. It's gluco because it came from a glucose, okay? This is D-glucose, which is just drawn in a chair form transition state. And then it's a pyranose because it's a six-member ring, okay? So we usually don't just have H, O, and C on the Fisher projection. We don't always just have HCO. Sometimes you'll have other elements like nitrogen or phosphorus, which brings the, the, the concept of substitution. Okay. So let's talk about substitutions. A number of common substitutions are possible. There are so many. Uh, usually you are replacing the OH group 
on a ring or on the fissure projection with an amine or a hydrogen. So let's first look at the second case. So take for example this OH. If it's taken out and replaced by a hydrogen, it means you've removed the hydroxy, so we call that deoxy. You've removed the OH group. The oxygen is gone, so it's deoxy genated so it's deoxy so and it's on the second carbon so once this is lost and you replace it with the hydrogen we call this molecule two deoxy ribose it's a ribose again because you have uh, five carbons on the structure okay now if it's a chair and you remove this um OH obviously this was the carbonyl so that's carbon 1 carbon 2 if you remove this OH and replace it with an amine that's going to be called 2 amino glucose so that's the case where an NH is used uh, to replace an OH on the ring okay so you either going to end up forming an amino group or an amide group but in this case we are making an amino group is not an amide. So substitution do occur either on the fissure projection. For example, I lose the OH and get an H. That's deoxygenation. So it's two, two deoxyribose for this one. Or the OH is lost. Replace it with an NH2. That's two amino glucose. Okay. Okay. So the OH can also be replaced by an R group. So let's say the R group is CH2OH. And let's say this was your fissure. Let's say this is what this was your fissure with two OHs. So if that OH is replaced by an R group, which could be CH2OH, then we're gonna call that D apios. Okay, the name changes because this is different. And then this one is where you have your ch2 with your oh okay this look like looks like a a beta ribose so i'm just drawing what you have down here and showing you the replacement so you're only replacing the oh with a phosphate so instead of having the beta D ribose, now you have beta D ribose 5 phosphate because this is the fifth carbon. This is the first carbon which came from the carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's possible to do OH substitution with a phosphate, with an R group, or with a H for deoxygenation, or with an amine. Those substitutions are very possible. Also, you can do what we call acetylation. Remember what we said about anhydrides? Okay, so let me show you. Let's say you're attacking this carbonyl. This whole piece will fall off as a living group. Okay, so you attack that carbon and this whole piece to the right will fall off, fall off as a living group. So you'll get your oxygen with the hydrogen and then you're gonna have your carbon and a metal group so this is the metal group and the carbonyl that's gonna be joined onto your oxygen of the ring okay but molecules don't like being positively charged so this this extra hydrogen should be taken out to neutralize it so you get an acetate so this this part right here is this part right here i'm just showing you shortcuts okay which is joined to this oxygen okay so you typically get an ester group right there okay so ac is acetate or acetal group sorry it's just ch3 carbonyl which is this part that we added on to the oxygen that's pointed so the rest falls off this falls off as o negative okay and then 
this is just part of the ring again so to explain the oxygen holding down the hydrogen is now bound to your anhydride it's bound to the anhydride which is this this circled part right here okay it's bound to the acetal which was that was part of the anhydride so this was the living group like i said later on this hydrogen should be taken out and you neutralize the oxygen that's how you get your oac which is simply um which is simply this structure right here so the ring with your carbonyl and oxygen so it's possible to do acetylation moving from oh to oac like i said oac is simply that this is the ac part the acetal part okay otherwise abbreviated as ac as shown here so you typically typically get an ester because this whole thing right here that's an ester the whole thing is an ester but part of the ester you have an acetal group that came from your anhydride so that's why this reaction will be called acetylation so you can imagine if you have excess of anhydride all ohs all these ohs will be converted to oac and that's called acetylation this reaction is usually used to deactivate glucose based enzymes in biochemistry those who take biochemistry you will see this reaction again okay other common modifications include alkylation so you can do alkylation with sn2 type of reaction using silver oxide as a catalyst you simply removing the hydrogens in this case and replacing them with the r group in this case our r group is a metal so where the hydrogens were we are putting ch3s that's called alkylation substitution okay so now you started with alpha d let's start with that and see it was a d glucose anyway so so it's alpha because the ch2oh and the oh bordering that oxygen are opposite in in, in direction in orientation so we call that beta so it's alpha d glucopyranose because there are six it's a six six membered ring that's why it's a pyranose but the name changes after these hydrogens have been replaced by an alkyl group which in this case is a metal you get how many metals that's one metal two three four and five so it's pentamethyl added but those metals happen to be inside an ether functional group remember what we said what ethers are carbon oxygen carbon that's an ether functional group not an ester so that's an ether an ether an ether an ether an ether so it's alpha d glucopyranose like we started but we've added metals so it's five metals penta metal ethers because all those metals are attached to an ether so that's alkylation modification by substitution substituting the hydrogens with the metals again this is a reaction that could be used during mutation or could be used to stop a biological event or reaction in a cascade of a mechanism in your body you'll talk about that in biochemistry those who take biochemistry okay like aldehydes and ketones carbohydrates can be reduced remember what we said reduction is reduction could be addition of hydrogens reduction could be addition of electrons reduction could also be removal of oxygens all these are evidences of reduction reaction so now let's assume you started with a pyranose pyranose because it's a six membered ring okay and then you open it up probably by acid catalysis 
it's a hemiacetal, you can bring it back to an aldehyde. This is cyclic. Once it's opened up, it's acyclic. Obviously, that's a fissure projection, and this is a chair. Okay. This will be a carbon number one. After it opens up, it's going to be a carbonyl to make the aldose. Aldose. Okay. Aldose because there's a presence of an aldehyde. So anyway, once you have your acyclic structure, the acyclic structure can undergo a reduction reaction with hydrogen. You're simply adding two hydrogens. So you're going to add one hydrogen onto this carbon and this pi bonds opens up adding the other hydrogen you end up with ch2oh you see how you only have one hydrogen and you're ending up with three of them which means you added two of them and we said addition of hydrogen atoms is reduction so this is a reduction you're moving from your aldose the aldehyde all the way to your alcohol nothing else on the fissure projection reacts only the aldehyde is reactive so you will have moved from D-glucose to D-glucitol, which is a storage form of D-glucose. If whoever will teach you biochemistry is, is so detailed, they'll talk about uh, D-glucitol, which is a re unreactive form of D-glucose. Aldehydes are more reactive than alcohols. That's why I'm saying this is unreactive. So either you're going to use hydrogen gas and a catalyst like palladium, so probably written as H2PD, poisoned with carbon. Or you can use a reducing agent like sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. All those will do the same job. Okay. All right. Let's see. So here we are looking at oxidation. So oxidation is the opposite of reduction. Probably you are adding oxygens. You are removing electrons or you are removing hydrogens. So in this case, you are starting with an aldehyde. And the aldehyde is converted to a carboxylic acid. Spot the difference. The difference. Here you have only one oxygen. Here you have two oxygens. You added oxygens. So the reaction that happened here generally is oxidation. Okay. And that can be done or accomplished using bromine, liquid bromine in water, or you use silver metal or copper too. Like in Benedict solution. We'll look at Benedict, Benedict solution which helps to, to oxidize to see whether we have reducing sugars or not. So a number of oxidizing reagents work, including nitric acid. You can use nitric acid, bromine, silver, or copper salts. So like here, you start with D-glucose, you end up with D-gluconic acid. So I talked about uh, copper two being used and I mentioned Benedict solution. So we use Benedict test to test the presence of a reducing sugar. So the reducing sugar will in itself reduce the copper, okay, as itself will be oxidized. So you see this, if this is a sugar, it's oxidized to the carboxylic acid. In general chemistry, you are told reducing agents are by themselves oxidized. Okay? So if sugar plays the role of an oxidizing agent, if sugar plays the role of a reducing agent, sorry, because it's a reducing sugar, then it's going to be oxidized itself. Okay? So you start with an aldehyde you end up with a carboxylic acid. Just like what you have here, glucose is one of the reducing sugars because it get it it has the it has the capability of being oxidized. Okay? So this is a reducing sugar because in itself is going to be oxidized. 
it reduces the reagent, so to speak. Okay. All right, so now the OH minus is going to be changed to water. The difference between the OH minus and water is one hydrogen, right? Remember what we said. Addition of hydrogens is reduction. So this OH has gained a hydrogen, so it's reduced. While the sugar itself, which is a reducing agent, is oxidized. So it's a way of testing whether we have reducing sugars. And usually the reducing sugars are the aldoses because they're going to be oxidized to the carboxylic acid. And you go with the visual color. So you're starting with a blue solution and you end up with a red solution. Why is it so? You start with copper 2. Here, the copper in there has a charge of 1 to copper 1. You see, oxidation can also be de defined as reducing of oxidation numbers or oxidation state. So the copper here, which copper 2, which is blue, is turned to copper 1. At the same time, it, the copper 1 is in the form of copper 1 oxide, which is a red precipitate. So and that's the evidence that, hey, you had a reducing sugar, which really um, reduced the copper 2 to copper 1. So it's a reducing sugar itself. It's oxidized to carboxylic acid, but the other partner is going to be reduced by the sugar. So this is test is called Benedict tests. If you have a reducing sugar in summary, again, you're going to see a change from blue to red, brick red, which means you have a reducing sugar, usually aldoses. Okay. Glycosides. Now, the cyclic hemiacetal can react with an additional alcohol to form an acetal. So this, for example, it's a bitter pyranose because the CH2OH and OH are on the same side. The CH2OH and OH on the anomeric carbon are on the same side, so it's bitter. It's a D-glucose because it came from D-glucose and it's a pyranose because it's six-membered ring. So this OH right here is what I want you to focus on. That OH can be replaced by the CH3 oil. So the shortcut to making acetals is always the shortcut that I show you where you're condensing the molecule. So take the alpha, take the anomeric OH, lose it with the hydrogen of the alcohol that's brought by to react with the hemiacetal. This is a hemiacetal that we already showed how it's formed by cyclization on the Fischer projection. So click the bond to the OCH3. You're going to get OCH3. And that's called a glycosidic bond because it can be used to bond onto another sugar. Okay. So when the anomeric OH is replaced by an OR group, the product is a glycoside. And the OR group has formed a glycosidic bond, which is the bond to the ether form. You know, again, this alcohol here could be another sugar like this that comes in, you get a glycosidic bond. So this is methyl bitter d glucopyranose It's bitter again because the CH2OH and, and uh, what should have been the OH is on the same side as the CH2OH. So that's the bitter form. And then it's a pyran pyranoside because now it's substituted with an R group. So pyranoside, glycoside. You get a glycosidic bond. Okay, all of the OH, OH groups are reactive to the formation of an ether, but the reaction at C1 is the most important in determining the pro properties of the oligo, polysaccharides, or disaccharides. So what we mean is that you see how we are only doing the condensation here 
this OH and H lost as water, we are only using this OH. Why are we not using that or that or that or that? The reason is it's this OH when it's substituted that's gonna give the dimer, the trimer, the oligosaccharide or polysaccharide if it's linking two sugars, it, their properties. Okay, so it's it's the most important because it determines the properties of the oligosaccharide or the polysaccharides. Now you might be wondering what I'm talking about. Let's look at a dimer. The first disaccharide that you can look at is maltose. You see, this used to be an OH. Okay, and this also used to be an OH. So how do we get the bond? We lose this OH of the first sugar, we call it a donor. So this part will be lost as water. And that's how you make that's how you make this bond here. So again, this is the glycosidic bond. And of course, this oxygen is down, the CH2OH is up you are looking at an alpha that's the alpha disaccharide or anoma in this side you have the ch2oh and oh on the same side that's called the beta okay so again you get a glycosidic bond on carbon one here because the oxygen here is opposite to the ch2oh on the other side and in this case this is the alpha again because these two guys are opposite but here this is beta because the ch2 and ch2 oh on the same side again you get a glycosidic bond this is the glycosidic carbon because it donated its oh to make the ether okay so maltose is a product of two hydro of the hydrolysis of starch it's a product of hydrolysis of starch, but it's still a, it's also a disaccharide of two glucose units. That's what I wanted to say. So you bring two glucose units together, they join one of the molecule lose the OH, they make an ether with a glycosidic bond. You get maltose, which is what you're seeing here. So this is the Haworth drawing. See the rings are flattened, but these are the chairs okay of the same both both structures are equivalent so lobios it's a disaccharide of two glucose units but they're gonna be linked by a beta one for linkage notice that this one was linked by alpha i explained those are alphas uh down up down up so they are alpha one for why are we calling it one for this is carbon one, two, three, four of the second ring, but this is carbon one of the first ring. So one, four, okay, one, four linkage, but it's alpha considering the carbon one, the oxygen is down, the CH2 is up, so it's alpha. So for cellobios, it looks like the same structure, but the difference is going to be the stereochemistry. This time your one four linkage, okay, one four linkage has the oxygen up and the CH2OH up. Both of them are on the same side. So what kind of one four linkage we have? It's called a beta one four linkage. And it's an isom of maltose, of course, because for maltose, this whole ring right here was down. But now for cellobios, it's up. The same can be drawn in chair form as shown above. Here you're, it's drawn in Howard projection or diagram. Sucrose, that's a common table sugar. It's a disaccharide combination of glucose and fructose. Sucrose is a disaccharide, but it's strange. It's joined by alpha 1 of one ring and uh, beta 2 carbon of the other ring so we call it alpha 1 beta 2 linkage so you see this is carbon 1 of the first pyranose but this is carbon 2 of the sec of the fructose of the 
uh, or the fructose okay furanos so we we officially call it alpha 1 beta 2 linkage this is this this five membered ring okay it's in beta form you see the ch2oh and the, and it's oxygen both of them are up up okay so it's beta form so it's beta 2 because you're linking the carbon 2 here the oxygen is down but the ch2oh is up so we call it alpha it's alpha 1 because the oxygen is bound to carbon 1 so this linkage here is wrong it's supposed to be alpha 1 beta 2 linkage to make the sucrose that's the Haworth projection so you have the glucose joined to a fructose by alpha 1 beta 2 linkage alpha 1 beta 2 linkage so that's the Haworth drawing and this is a chair drawing again obviously you see here on the carbon 2 it's beta because the oxygen and the CHOH are both on same both of them are up this oxygen is up you see the bond is pointing up and this bond is pointing up so it's beta and then here the oxygen looking at this ring this oxygen is down right focusing on the top ring that oxygen is below this the structure and then CH2 is up the structure so we call we call this bond alpha or we call this carbon alpha because they are opposites so you have alpha 1 and then of course that's a 2 beta 2 linkage in the sucrose we'll continue from there with disaccharides